All right, so today's lecture is going to be over kind of a little grab bag of topics. Um, we're going to talk about foreign bodies, eye, ear, nose. We're going to talk very briefly about neoplasms, and then we're going to cover the nose disorders. So let me get my pen ready. Here we go. We are on a day four lecture. Uh, we have one left after this. Here are your learning objectives as always. As you can see today, we have um, a shorter lecture than we have been covering. And so we'll try our best to just kind of hit the high points, get through them so that you can continue studying. So a really fun topic to talk about is foreign bodies. So foreign body is anything that doesn't belong in our body and any orifice or even under the skin. For the purposes of these ENT lectures, we'll be talking about foreign bodies in the eyes, which we've kind of touched on a little bit in the eye lecture. We'll also talk about foreign bodies in the ears and the nose. And so uh, working in the emergency department, foreign bodies are a pretty common thing. And it's actually quite satisfying to remove these, although they can be quite challenging. So I'll try my best to share my pearls of wisdom with you on how to get these items out of where they are in the body. <clears throat> so let's first talk about eye foreign body. So most common foreign bodies that we see in the eye are, you know, dust, dirt, particles, pieces of grass that float up like when we're mowing the lawn. Uh, another really common form body that we see is what's pictured here, which is a, a, a met metallic form body. We see that a lot with uh, folks that grind metal or weld. Um, can also get sand in the eye, dirt, uh, things like that. Um, the typical presentation for someone that has a foreign body is some sort of history. So I was welding or I was metal grinding or I was mowing the lawn or at the beach. Uh, and then they present with pain. Uh, they can have some photophobia. And the main thing that I see is foreign body sensation because they really do have a foreign body in their eye. Go figure. And the red eye. Okay. Uh, on physical exam, with these patients, you're going to want to look first just with your eyes. A lot of times the patients are very uncomfortable, so it's a good idea to do to place some numbing drops within the eye and then do a, a fluorescein stain so that you can look for little uptakes, abrasions, and then always, always, always flip your upper lid. Flip your upper lid and look up underneath there because a lot of times foreign bodies can hang out there. When you document a foreign body on the eye, you should document it like a clock face. So 12, you know, um, 3, 6, 9. So this would be about the 10 o'clock position. So you should document uh, foreign bodies that way. Um, so for, if, main thing that you want to rule out is, is that is there a, a gl penetrating globe injury? If there's a penetrating globe injury, it is much more severe, much more significant. Um, we want to try to remove foreign bodies if we see them. If it's a, a bunch of foreign bodies, like say sand, then we're going to have to irrigate the eye. And one of the better ways to do that is by a Morgan lens. Uh, we talked about that in the eye lecture. Uh, it's essentially like a contact lens that looks like this. We stick up under the eye with a little tube and with that tube we connect it to an IV pole and stick that in the eye after applying some numbing drops and just flush the eye. Uh, that will help. If it's a solitary foreign body, especially like a small metallic foreign body like this, then first I try to use a, a moistened cotton tip applicator. If that doesn't move it, especially if it's been there for at least 24 hours, um, it's going to start the epithelializing that, that um, the cornea. It turns over really quickly, so you start getting rustering formation and things. I usually use then a, a needle, uh, and I don't poke puncture the eye. I just kind of scrape the surface of the eye, of course, numbing it first. And then to remove the, the rust ring that forms around, you use a little burr which oscillates and that can um, remove it. Also prescribe um, antibiotic, topical antibiotics to help prevent infection. And then refer to ophthalmology 
especially if the foreign body or the removal was within the vision area. <clears throat> All right, ear foreign bodies. So ear foreign bodies are not true emergencies because the ear is a finite cavity, right? So it, there is only so far that a foreign body can go before it gets to the tympanic membrane. Um, one thing that, that obviously we would want to treat soon, as soon as possible is a live insect. Uh, and we've seen those many times in the ER and they're extremely uncomfortable. And the patient just cannot sit still, even with the tiniest little insect in there, because they, they kind of claw and scratch and go into fight or flight mode within the ear canal. They cause, uh, they can even, you know, burrow straight through the tympanic membrane. So definitely uh, something we want to treat urgently if we have an insect in the ear. Um, other things like small beads or toys, pebbles, um, can be delayed for ENT outpatient, but if they present to the ear, we try our best to remove these things safely. So the history or clinical, clinical presentation is going to be usually in kids. Kids like to explore and put things in places they don't belong. A caregiver is going to describe a foreign body in the ear, possibly, um, some ear pain, some decreased hearing, and then depending on what it is, uh, purulent or bloody um, drainage from the ear. When we look in the ear, we should be able to see the, the foreign body. So we would see a bug, and the bugs always look way bigger than they actually are in real life. A uh, little bead, anything um, organic material. And we want to try our best to remove foreign bodies. So you want to try to appreciate if the tympanic membrane is intact. If it is intact, then we can use either instrumentation or irrigation to get the the item out. So I uh, personally, not ex excluding bugs, we'll talk about bugs separately. But if it's just a not a, a foreign body that's not a bean or something that will expand with water and not a button battery and no ruptured tympanic membrane, irrigation is my method of of choice. And so for that, we do something similar to what we did with sermon impactions. We get a pretty large uh, syringe, like 20 cc or so, and attach a 18 gauge catheter tip on there. And we flush flush that out with some lukewarm water. Sometimes if there's a lot of cerumen there, we also introduce some peroxide. Now, a very important, you don't want to put this in the ear for anything that's going to expand like a bean um, button batteries are big. No, no, those need to be, be removed ASAP. And then if you have a ruptured tympanic membrane, you don't want to introduce any liquids. Um, it can cause, um, aggressive flushing can cause perforation of the tympanic membrane. So you just, it's just a gentle push of the, of the medic of the fluids. Um, as far as instrumentation, we have several different methods. We can use little forceps, like alligator forceps. We can use curettes, these little scoopers, um, sometimes suction, although most of the time that's in specialized clinics. And then insects are their own thing. So insects, the first thing you want to do is kill the insect. And you can either use a mineral oil or a lidocaine, and you want to just kind of fill that ear canal. Do not use water because the bug will swim around trying to fight for his life and it becomes more uncomfortable. So we we place that in the ear. Usually in the ER, I'll put some lidocaine in there. That will suffocate the insect. They'll die. The patient will feel a little bit better. And then we go about trying to remove the insect. Um, you can either grab it uh, by instrumentation or my preferred method is irrigation. Now, if they penetrate the tympanic membrane, or if you can't get them out uh, on your initial attempt, then you can refer to ENT. And this can be done kind of outpatient, unless it's a button battery or a bug or something that's still alive, you know, then you can refer and they can have this done on an outpatient basis. Nasal foreign bodies, on the other hand, are true emergencies because there is a risk for aspiration. So, you know, the back of the nose is connected to the throat, which is connected to the, the lungs. So uh, we want to make sure to remove these objects ASAP to, pre to prevent 
uh, aspiration. So again, just like the other foreign bodies, it's more common in toddlers, preschool children. They get things and they they get it, they explore them and they stick them places they don't belong. Most common things I've seen are like little beads from necklaces, small toys like Legos, candy. Uh, now, one thing that is significant are button batteries and magnets as they can actually perforate the nasal septum. Um, on history, usually the caregiver has witnessed them place it up there or they have something that's missing. Uh, there's usually some discharge from that note, from that nary that is blocked. And if you have a retained form body that's been there for a while, then we can get the, this foul odor because you get that blockage, things get kind of stagnant there. Also, if we have a significant trauma, we can get some bleeding. So on exam, we were looking for the foreign body. Or we're looking for swelling of the, the nary and the internal nasal passage. And sometimes there's blood present. Sometimes it can be so swollen that you can't see the foreign body. And that's, I actually had a case one time where a little boy was hanging out with his grandma. And they had those little uh, fidget spinners that light up. And the grandma found the little boy with the fidget spinner and she could not find both the batteries, the little button batteries that went in there. She became concerned, called the mom. The mom wasn't too concerned, but said, oh, I better go get him checked. Brought him to my ER, told me, uh, well, my mom said that he might have put something in there, but I don't think he did. He's fine, you know. And I looked up there with my, um, my otoscope. And I couldn't see anything. I just saw a lot of swelling on one of the the, the, the nares and a little bit of drainage, but I could not see a foreign body. So anyways, I leave the room and I talk to my supervising doctor who goes in and looks himself and he himself says, you know what? I don't see anything either. So he's fine. Just discharge him home. You know, but something just didn't sit right with me. I just, I don't know what it was. It's like, a hunch or like intuition or like that gut feeling and I say you know what I'm gonna do a quick x-ray just to make sure because if it, if it's up there it can cause significant damage so I shot a quick plain film of the the head and sure sure enough there was a button battery stuck and it was deep enough in there that you could not see it on an inspection and so because of this we tried myself and my supervising doctor to remove it there in the emergency department and we were unsuccessful we it was too deep we didn't have any nasal speculums the kid was a little uncooperative he was pretty small so we called our ENT on call and, and they asked us to send him directly to his office and he had it removed there um <clears throat> that's just uh you know a story of warning to kind of listen to your judgment right um for treatment if they're small like this and they're kind of obstructing the whole area, it's kind of hard. I mean, kids' noses are like little coffee straws. So they're hard to stick instruments in. One thing that works really, really well is this uh, positive pressure technique, which is essentially like the mother's kiss. So what you do is you plug up the patent nair and you have the mom or the dad put their mouth uh, completely around the child's mouth and then blow forcefully. And what that does is it creates positive pressure which uh, goes up and back through the nose and pushes that foreign body out. What I explained to my parents is it's a lot less traumatic for you to do this than for me to hold them still and try my best to grab it with some forceps and they're gonna scream and cry and hate it. So I usually try this first if the, the parent is willing to, and it's worked so many times for me. After that, I mean, there's other things you can do. You can try to manually grab it with uh, little forceps. You can also, I've seen folks kind of use the, the opposite end of a cotton tip applicator and use some of the glue, like Germabond that we use for skin, and stick it on the foreign body and then pull it out. I've seen folks use suction. I mean, there's all sorts of um, catheters. There's all sorts of techniques, but the main thing is we have to get it out. If we can't get it out, we need to get an ENT consult to prevent aspiration.
from a neoplasm standpoint, I am not going to cover this in depth. Uh, we're going to just skim the surface. And so just bear with me, we'll get through it pretty quickly. So one thing we are going to talk about, at least superficially, is retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is the most common primary intraocular malignancy in children. Um, it can either be inherited with the uh, retinoblastoma gene, or it can be kind of sporadic or spontaneous. Um, we see the sporadic ones usually unilaterally, whereas the uh, hereditary are more bilaterally, and they are also associated with other malignancies like osteosarcoma, and this comes up a lot in vignettes. Um, the age of onset is usually less than three years old, and how patients are usually found to have this? Well, one, we do uh, monthly and yearly checks for kiddos, uh, well, child visits. Hopefully, we're doing everything we need to be doing to, to catch this. Otherwise, nowadays, with smartphones and, and the use of them to take pictures, and we take tons and tons of pictures nowadays, and with the flash photography, you can usually, the normal would be to see that, that red reflex, to see that red eye. And in pictures, parents will take a picture with the flash and they'll notice that one eye has a red reflex, the other has kind of a white or a cat's eye. And that is how a lot of patients come, come in and then they're diagnosed. So obviously, as with any cancer, the earlier that you diagnose and treat, the better the prognosis. If it's left untreated, it's almost always fatal. And so what we see on clinical presentation is that leukocoria or the cat's eye pupil where it should be red. It is white. Sometimes because the vision is impaired on that side, you can get some strabismus because of it. And um, sometimes it's painful, other times not. You get loss of vision. In later stages, because of the growth of the tumor, you can have retinal detachment. And then more rarely, can you can see some nystagmus. So you can see proptosis of the eye where it kind of bulges outward or orbit orbital cellulitis. Uh, physical exam, uh, you're going to look at the fundus, you're going to see this grayish white uh, tumor looking thing in the back of the eye. Um, and then if you see that, uh, then you should get uh, either an oc ocular ultrasound or a, a, an enhanced MRI, usually MRI. So depending on the stage of retinoblastoma, there are different treatments that we can do. Uh, one, if the eye, if it's early and the eye can be salvageable, you can do some cryotherapies, photocoagulation, uh, or brachytherapy. I don't expect you to know all of this, so, but the high risk ones, we add on chemotherapy. And then if it's too far advanced, then we have to remove the eye. Um, and then in the case of metastatic disease, you're going to add on chemo and radiation. Uh, I don't expect you to know these treatments in depth, but just know that there is kind of a progression of treatment anywhere from localized treatment to removal of the eye with, with plus or minus chemo and radiation therapy. Some other quick neoplasms just to mention, uh, we have, you know, because it's EENT, we include the neck, there's thyroid disease, remember papillary is more common, but we learned about this in endocrinology, so we're just going to leave it at that. As far as oral cancers, um, the most common or most often seen oral cancer would be a squamous cell carcinoma, which y'all covered in germ. And of course, tobacco, alcohol are uh, risk factors for developing squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, there's a, a branchial cleft cyst. It's the cyst that can appear after a URI, kind of uh, around the SCM muscle. And it's the most common lateral neck mass, not to be confused with like lymphadenopathy and things like that. Um, for thyroglossal duct cysts, they're usually kind of in the anterior neck area and it can rise when you stick your tongue out. And that is the most common midline neck mass. Then we also have lymphadenopathy, which you covered in probably hematology, um, thinking about things like lymphoma and other types of cancers. And then last but not least, leukoplakia, which is a white oral lesion. It is it itself is not cancer, but it, it it increases the risk of cancer by a lot. And so this is a uh, painless. It can't be scrubbed off the tongue, and it's also associated with use of alcohol, tobacco, and dentures. 
Uh, about 5% of these develop into squamous cell cancers. So we will talk about leukoplakia more specifically in the mouth lecture. So diagnosis-wise, thyroid um, nodules, a lot of times they're visualized or, or palpated on exam. You can get ultrasounds, and then, of course, we should biopsy them to make a formal diagnosis. For oral cancer, biopsy is the, the big deal. Uh, lymphoma, also um, biopsy. Looking for the reen sternberg cells for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then leukoplakia, um, you should also, we'll talk about this later, get those biopsies. Treatment, so thyroid cancer and nodules, um, removal with thyroidectomies with chemotherapy, which we're not going to get into. Oral cancers, like we said, squamous cell carcinoma, you've talked about this in germ. You can do a Mohs or a surgical excision. And then, um, you know, of course, we have risk for metastases. You must evaluate that. A lymphoma, you guys already talked about that. Leukoplakia, we'll talk about that next next lecture. And that is all I'm going to cover for cancers. There are a lot of other cancers, but they're, they're not high yield. And so we're just going to keep moving along. So next up, we're going to talk about epistaxis. Epistaxis is a nosebleed. It's a fancy word for nosebleeds. Uh, there are a ton of different etiologies that cause nosebleeds, but by far the most common is going to be digital trauma. So sticking your finger in your nose, picking your nose. Um, uh, also things like trauma, allergic rhinitis, infection, having a foreign body stuck up there, um, and other things. There's a bunch. You can see that long, exhaustive list. So there are two different types of nosebleeds. There's an anterior epistaxis and a posterior epistaxis. Anterior is by far more common. It's the most common location. And it's associated with a defect or bleed in the Kissel box plexus or Little's area. That is high yield. You should probably know that for patho. Um, and it is in the anterior part of the nose. So when you talk about the nose, there's anterior and then more posterior back here. Um, now, posterior epistaxis is less, much less common. It's only about 5% of bleeds. This comes from Woodruff's plexus, uh, specifically this phenopalatine artery, which is a branch of the maxillary artery. And these are significantly more, um, more dangerous, less common, but they can cause severe nosebleeds to the point of uh, morbidity, mortality. So they must be uh, taken care of. And we see it a lot associated with hypertension and in the elderly population. So as far as clinical presentation, anterior epistaxis, I would say that a, I would say quite a few of us have probably had an anterior nosebleed before. I know I have. Uh, a lot of patients have been have recent trauma, like got hit in the face with a ball, um, upper respiratory infections where that nasal mucosa has become kind of more friable, allergies. Um, they might have recently used cocaine, nasal sprays, things that, that, that might have irritated it. And then usually the bleeding is unilateral and they don't usually feel a lot of blood pooling or dripping down the back of the throat unless they're doing the wrong thing and they're tilting their head back, which is not uh, recommended. And the blood is usually kind of a blight, bright red. Now for posterior epistaxis, uh, you cannot see that side of bleeding when you look up in the nose because it's too far back. And these patients usually present with a large amount of blood dripping down the back of the throat to where it's kind of causing them to choke and they start, they're coughing up or they're, they're spitting up blood and the blood is usually a darker color. Now this is a caveat. There's a caveat to everything. It's not always like this, but that's typical. Um, so in physical exam, if it is an anterior bleed, sometimes you can directly visualize the source of bleeding where you can see exactly where that blood is coming out. 
Um, you want to definitely determine on physical exam whether this is an anterior or posterior bleed because the treatment is different. And then if, if there's trauma associated, like if you got hit in the face, you want to assess for uh, bony fractures of the face or the sinuses, the nose, the orbits. So m the vast majority of anterior nosebleeds uh, don't require anything other than some applying pressure. Um, most of the time, if patients are coming into your clinic or your emergency department because of it, they've probably tried it, although I wouldn't assume that they have. I've had several moms that kind of panic when their kids' nose start bleeding and, you know, they, they do the, where they cover, they put a little bit of pressure for like 30 seconds and they check it. Then they have the kid blow their nose, then it starts bleeding again, then they put a little more pressure. So, uh, I would certainly after a physical exam recommend at least 10 to 15 minutes of constant pressure with the, the head tilted forward. And I mean, constant, not checking it every 30 seconds. Um, and that usually resolves the majority of the cases that I've seen, at least the minor uh, anterior cases. If it's pretty significant bleeding, uh, you might consider that there could be some sort of bleeding disorder, especially if there's recurrent epistaxis. So those with those patients, you can consider getting a platelet count and a PTPTT, just looking for any, hype, um, any hemophilia or anything like that, any reason why they, they would keep bleeding. And then, of course, if you're suspecting that there's some sort of tumor or anything like that, uh, trauma, then you might consider getting a CT scan. But I'll tell you, the vast majority of these are benign. So treatment-wise, for anterior bleeds, like I said, most of them can be treated with direct pressure. Constant direct pressure, 10 to 15 minutes, head tilted forward, um, like that. If the bleeding continues... You should try to do a better exam to look for the site of the bleeding. And then there's several different things that can be done. If you can visualize the bleeding source, you can use a little silver nitrate um, stick or pen to cauterize that bleed. Um, you can also put a pledge it in, which is essentially getting some gauze and dipping it in some Afrin, soaking it in Afrin. Uh, and then sticking it up the nose and then applying pressure for another 15-20 minutes and then checking to see if the, the bleed has gone away. You can also use topical cocaine, although I've never used that before. And then if all else fails, the last measure is an anterior packing. We have several different methods of anterior packing and I included a little video on your blackboard of some different options that we have. Um, I do have an algorithm on the next page that talks a little bit about the approach to the nosebleed. Posterior bleeds uh, are going to be much more high risk. Uh, so you should, if you, if you suspect a posterior bleed, you should get a specialist involved earlier, sooner rather than later. They're going to have to be um, inpatient monitoring and, <clears throat> and, and, you know, monitored. So posterior packing is super uncomfortable, is a lot more difficult, um, and so you should get the ENT involved earlier. Um, again, the recurrent epistaxis, if you have a patient that's having over and over again, think about hypertension and uh, hypercoagulable disorders. <clears throat> so here's a quick hit slide that kind of uh, compares and contrasts anterior versus posterior. Um, the sites the age groups, the causing, and then the kind of bleeding that there is. Uh, so this is a nice little algorithm from up to date. We have an active nosebleed. First thing we're going to do are our ABCs. Uh, you know, if they are not you know, breathing, they don't have good airway, then we have to resuscitate and support. You know, think about that with posterior bleeds. You have a lot of blood and you can aspirate. So let's think about that. Um, so the first conservative measures are going to be to squeeze the nose and bend at the waist. You can also give a couple sprays of Afrin to try to stop that. If conservative measures don't work and bleeding persists, you want to try to look up there. If you can see the blight, the, the site of bleeding, you can uh, decide to cauterize it. If not, then uh, you can put a pledge it up there, which is just some gauze with some oxymetazoline. If that doesn't work, you can put in one of the anterior nasal packing. Um, 
And then, you know, of course, the bleeding stops. You can kind of stop there. If the bleeding persists, then we're going to have to start thinking about posterior packing and getting ENT involved. Here's a quick bed comic on nosebleeds. It helps us remember that the Kisselbox plexus is the anterior bleed where Woodruff's is um, posterior and then the associated things you see here. Nasal polyps. So nasal polyps are non-cancerous growths that grow within the nose, sometimes in the sinuses. Most often we see it kind of in the, as we look into the nose for inspection, they are described as pale and boggy, boggy kind of wet and pale looking little masses within the nasal mucosa. There are several different reasons why patients get nasal polyps. One thing you should think about is cystic fibrosis, especially if it's in a child. Uh, also, patients with allergic rhinitis are more common to getting uh, nasal polyps. And we think of Samter's triad, which is that asthma, sinus inflammation with nasal polyps and aspirin sensitivity. Also, patients with allergic rhinitis, um, we tend to think of that or, you know, allergies, looking for allergic shiners and other things that could kind of clue you in that that's what it is. Um, if you see uh, multiple uh, nasal polyps, uh, it can be a red flag, and you should definitely assess the patient for cystic fibrosis. <clears throat> Uh, so most often patients present with trouble breathing. It's not respiratory trouble breathing, but more just their nose. One near or wherever the polyp is is clogged up and it's hard to breathe through that nostril. Uh, they kind of get this chronic congestion. On that side, you can get a loss of smell and taste reciprocally. Um, you can also have a postnasal drip and then some runny nose. On physical exam, you will see this what, as they describe pale, boggy, edematous um, mucosal mass. And then on a diagnosis, it's really just looking. You can get these other tests if you're concerned, but most are just clinically diagnosed. Treatment, um, you can use topical or nasal spray corticosteroid. That's the initial treatment of choice. Um, if you can't get it under control after using that for three months at least, then you can consider uh, surgical removal, especially if it's impeding patient's ability to breathe well. Um, you can also use oral steroids. However, I've seen more of the topical as first line. Um, and that's about it. Nasal polyps. Rhinitis. So rhinitis, rhine, like a rhino is nose, right? Itis, inflammation or infection. Uh, and so it, rhinitis is inflammation or infection of the nasal mucosa. It can be caused by many different things. Rhinitis itself can be caused by upper respiratory pathogens like viruses. It can be um, caused by allergic components. You can also get a vasomotor rhinitis with, say, cold or um, spicy foods and things. And then the last one that we hear about is rhinitis medicamentosa, which is um, an overuse of the decongestant sprays, usually containing afrin, or, uh, oxymetazoline, or phenylephrine, and this causes a rebound uh, issue with congestion, and it's a vicious cycle. We'll talk about that in a minute. So allergic rhinitis, as you can remember, full circle back to the first module that you had is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. What? We remember that? Yeah. Um, Symptoms can be confused with a common cold. You often see uh, rhinorrhea, itchy, watery eyes, sneezing, nasal congestion, sometimes a dry cough. You can have kind of a pale or boggy nasal mucosa, plus or minus those um, nasal polyps. And the, the discharge that we have is usually clear, watery. You can see it also along with the allergic conjunctivitis. Diagnosis is made by history. And then if, if it's hard to control or if you're concerned about certain um, specific allergens, you can do the allergy skin testing. Um, and physical exam, I mean, you can see several things, including allergic shiners, which look like little black or bluish colored eyes in kids mainly. Then we get what's called the allergic salute, where you get this kind of nasal crease here from the kids uh, constantly wiping their nose. Uh, and then, of course, some clear discharge on exam, maybe plus or minus some polyps within the nose of clear... Um, some boggy mucosa. Uh, of course, as with any allergy, you want to uh, try to avoid the known allergens. 
If you're like me, I'm allergic to almost everything. Grasses, pollens. Uh, this is also referred to as hay fever. Um, but although it doesn't really cause fever and it's not just hay that causes it. So I like allergic rhinitis better, but just in case you were uh, wondering. So treatments for allergic rhinitis, first line, typically, if it's a if it's just one agent, is going to be uh, a nasal corticosteroid, like a Flonase or or something like that. Uh, other things that you can add on to is an oral non-drowsy antihistamine, and then other things like uh, chromalin sodium, saline nasal drops or washes, and then last but not least, if that doesn't control it all the way, you can use immunotherapy or allergy shots. Vasomotor rhinitis has to do with some sort of precipitant like the cold air, uh, certain smells or irritants like chili peppers, things like that. It's not really a diagnosis that we make very often, but it's just another form of rhinitis. Um, and you just avoid the irritant. Okay. Rhinitis metamentosa is, is a real thing uh, because Afrin spray is over the counter, it's readily available. And it works. I mean, I was always scared to use it because in PA school, they kind of told like, told us, no, shame, you can't use it because it will cause rhinitis medicamentosa. Uh, but one time I was in Vegas, I had a cold and I was pretty miserable. And so I just decided to give it a shot, like literally, and it works so well. I can see why people get hooked. But anyways, um, what happens is you get nasal congestion, you spray that afrin up, it clears your nose like instantly and you feel good. So you use it, become dependent on it. And because you use it, it, um, it actually causes a rebound congestion, which is then you need to use it more. And so it's, it's a uh, vicious cycle. So the treatment for that is to discontinue the irritant. I have seen several vignettes on this for a standardized tests for, for questioning. So just be able to recognize it. You usually see something in the history and the treatment is to discontinue the, the irritant. You can also use some topical corticosteroids to kind of get them through that withdrawal period. Moving on to sinusitis. Now, sinusitis and upper respiratory infections are not the same thing. I've seen a lot of providers uh, kind of kind of overlap the two diagnoses. Sinusitis has very specific criteria for diagnosis. Um, acute sinusitis it has to be less than four weeks duration. Usually, get kind of a sudden onset. Most common are going to be the same three bugs we've seen over and over again, strep pneumo, H flu, and MCAT. Um, most of the time we see this as kind of a precipitated by an acute viral upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, and so when you have that, it kind of, you get stagnant mucus within the sinuses, most often maxillary and ethmoid uh, sinuses. And that causes uh, accumulation of bacteria and then bacterial sinusitis. Um, Chronic sinusitis greater than 12 consecutive weeks has different organisms associated like staph, and anaerobes, and this is much less common, uh, but it can happen. Then there's also a subacute sinusitis, which is in that interim period, which can kind of be a mixture, a grab bag of things. So general characteristics, um, we tend to evaluate for sinusitis. A patient comes in with fever and headache. Uh, we want to palpate and percuss those sinuses, especially the frontal and maxillary where they are close to the surface. And you want to differentiate between a viral thing like a rhino, rhinitis or rhinosinusitis or allergic from a bacterial. Like we said, bacterial sinusitis usually follows an upper respiratory infection. Um, and the same bugs that we talked about. There's also... In, Increased risk factors including cigarette smoke or sec exposure to smoke, history of trauma, or foreign body can also put you at higher risk. So acute sinusitis is a clinical diagnosis, um, typically. Usually what we see is uh, symptoms that, that start after an upper respiratory infection where the patient kind of has a virus, they get a little better from the virus, and then bam, they get worse. They get sinus pain, pressure, fever, and usually it... it lasts over four, five to seven days and does not improve in greater than 10 days. Uh, we usually get fever, facial pain and pressure, headache, purulent discharge from the nose, congestion, sometimes loss of smell. And because the sinuses are literally right on top of the teeth, sometimes you can get like a, a tooth pain or it feels kind of like a toothache, but it is your sinuses. 
um, complications because the sinuses are kind of connected all within here. You can get orbital cellulitis, cavernous sinus thrombosis, osteomyelitis. But those are more rare findings. Classically, on physical exam, you per percuss and palpate the sinuses and they are tender. You can also use light to do translamination, although I've never done it. It will look more opacified because it's filled with mucus. Uh, diagnosis, like I mentioned, is usually clinical. However, if you're concerned, uh, you can get either a plain view, which is a water, a, a plain x-ray with a water's view. Uh, although we don't use that very often, usually CT is the gold standard if we are uh, concerned. We don't have to get a CT to make the diagnosis, though. Treatment uh, includes NSAIDs. Um, saline washes, nasal decongestants, and, and intranasal corticosteroids, all those can be adjunctive therapy. It, patients most of the time will improve within two weeks without antimicrobial therapy. However, there are some indications for antibiotics. Uh, first, of, first indication would be the symptoms last greater than 10 days and they're not getting better and we give some antibiotics. The fever, the patient has fever of greater than 102 or they have purulent nasal discharge, we give them antibiotics. And third, if they fit that that profile of having uh, URI symptoms, getting better, and then all of a sudden, boom, getting worse after initial improvement, that is cl classic of a bacterial sinusitis and we give antibiotics. First line antibiotic is going to be Augmentin or uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid. Uh, and that's usually how we treat it. You can also consider some of these other treatments if needed. We usually treat if it's uncomplicated, five to seven days, but for most that I've seen, we, we treat with uh, 10 to 14 days. If we don't see an improvement after 72 hours, we can switch or we can get a CT to see if there's something else going on. Here's our medcomic for sinusitis. Then I got a couple algorithms for treatment. They're a little specific, talking about Augmentin and other, other players in treatment, how to monitor and to change if needed. Um, and, and it also looks at imaging here. And then here's for pediatric. I don't expect you to know the specific doses or things, but it does kind of mention uh, how to treat and when to treat. Last up, we have trauma. The nose is part of our body that kind of sticks out a little bit, so it is more prone to both sun exposure and trauma, and it is vulnerable. So some of the traumas that we tend to see in emergency department or urgent care are nasal contusions, which is when you have blunt trauma to the nose. Contusion is a bruise, right, or, or a damage to the soft tissue, and that would be without fracture. It's very common. Uh, we also have nasal bone fractures, which can be a break in the bone or the cartilage. Uh, and most um, non-deviated uh, fractures can be treated with just uh, conservative measures, just watching the areas, no cast or splint that you can really put on the nose. Now, if it's significantly displaced or deformed, then those need to be reset, usually either reset in the emergency department or refer to ENT or plastic surgery where they can reset that area. Now, if they have a degree of septal deviation, the septum, remember, is the, the separator between the, the two sides of the nose. If you get a deviation of that, that can be more, um, more painful and cause some trouble, longer trouble with breathing on one side or the other. They have trouble sleeping and things like that. Another thing is if you have any type of nasal trauma, you should always, always, always look for and document the, the absence of a septal hematoma. A septal, remember, the septum is in the middle. It should be pretty thin. You shouldn't see much. But if you have kind of swelling with in or around the septum, you should think about septal hematoma. And the bleeding happens between the mucosa and the, the cartilage and the peri, perichondrium, which can cause an avascular necrosis if not treated, not drained. And so these need to be uh, urgently referred to have an IND and uh, observation. Um, they, we, we always ask about that in the emergency department. One other thing that can happen with trauma or with a repetitive use of things like cocaine can be a septal perforation where you actually get a hole in the septum and the two nares communicate. I actually had a patient not too long ago that came in for a nosebleed and 
And when I looked in there, I was like, whoa, my light shine on the other nostril when I, when I shined it on one side. And he said, oh, yeah, by the way, I used to use cocaine. And so I have uh, a septal perforation. Anyways. So we want to get a good history, figure out how the mechanism of the injury took place. We're looking for nasal pain, swelling, deformity, bleeding, and then always, always a septal hematoma. On physical exam, you want to inspect, you want to palpate for any bony step-offs. You also want to palpate the orbits because it's all kind of connected in this in this area. Orbits and maxillaries, a zygoma, all of that, feeling for any tenderness or step-offs. You want to look inside the nose, looking for, again, that septal hematoma, or if there is a bleeding, you want to try to find the source of the bleeding. And you can assess for patency. You can imagine with a deformity like this uh, that you might have decreased patency. Um, minor, minor fractures that are non-displaced, like these little tiny little fractures, surely not much that can be due, and you actually don't have to get imaging, although, and I'm in the ER, I tend to get imaging because it kind of puts the patient's um, mind at ease to know or not know. Um, and then if we're concerned for displacement or other injuries, we, we want to definitely get the CT. It's definitely better than the x-ray. Uh, nasal injuries, we're going to do pain management. Controlling of the bleeding, if there is one, um, ice to the area, laceration repairs. And then if there is a septal hematoma or significant displacement, sinus fractures, large deformities, you want to refer urgently to EENT or plastic surgery. And again, it's good to educate patients that most minor nasal fractures do not warrant any treatment. It's just kind of watchful waiting and healing. So last but not least, I have a quick photo challenge for you. Uh, here we have a large, pale, boggy-looking item. It's a nasal uh, allergic allergic rhinitis. Over here we can see here, this is pretty swollen. Um, here we see a nasal polyp. Oh, here's a deviated nasal septum. So this should be right here in between the two. Because that's a deviated septum. Um, we also have here nasal polyp and a perforated septum. So you can actually see right through the other side. And that's it. So as I promised, about 45 minutes worth of lecture here. Not too bad. Um, so you have extra time to study some things that maybe you don't remember from previous lectures or to get ahead for your last lecture. Uh, but either way, if you have any questions, reach out to me and I will see you in class. Thank you.